أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وبه نستعين وهو خير ناصر ومعين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين أما بعد My respected elders, my dearest brothers and sisters in Iman, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. In this segment of our lecture, we would like to respond to some of the loose strings associated and attached with the previous discussions we were having about the Quranic criteria for salvation and also the relaxed uh, criteria. So there were some questions about non-Abrahamic faiths. Uh, and the possibility of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, forgiving them and granting them a reward based on the same relaxed criteria that he has mentioned in uh, chapter 2 verse 62 and chapter 5 verse 69 where he identifies three key points which is belief in Allah, the last and final day of judgment and good deeds. So can this be extended to non-Abrahamic faiths? So the answer actually is there in, in the verse itself. So the group, the Sabi'in, or the Sabi'un, as in 569, the group of the Sabi'un that's mentioned over there, these were essentially a non-Abrahamic uh, faith group, the Sabians. And if you go into the Tafsir literature, you will see uh, different claims being made about them. Um, it is believed that they were star worshippers, some of them. So some of them were actually... Uh, guilty of shirk and yet when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comes to identifying the core criteria for salvation he mentions iman billah so if you have iman billah and even if your community has gone into shirk but somehow you are able to save yourself from shirk you're able to salvage the correct tawheed from whatever has reached you then the door of salvation is open to you even if you were born into a community that was otherwise involved in shirk and polytheism. So one thing we have to be very clear about is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely seals shut the door for salvation as far as the crime of shirk is concerned. So that, that is very clear from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's descriptions of iman. For example, in Surah number 6, Surah Al-An'am, verse 82, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَلَمْ يَلْبِسُوا إِيمَانَهُمْ بِظُلْمٍ أُولَٰئِكَ لَهُمُ الْأَمْنُ وَهُمْ مُهْتَدُونَ Allah says, indeed, those who believe and then do not corrupt or contaminate or pollute or dilute and mix up. يَلْبِسُوا, they mix up or they clothe. So those people who believe and then do not mix up their iman bi zulmin with zulm, which all the mufassirin here are agreed that the zulm that Allah is talking about here refers to the same zulm that he has identified in Surah Luqman. When he quotes Luqman as saying, Inna shirka la zulmun azim. Shirk is indeed a great zulm, a great and grave act of zulm. So, because shirk is called zulm in the Quran and also, for example, iftira, which is the root of shirk, making a claim about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without certain ilm, without certain knowledge from him, without an endorsement for that claim in his book, that is called iftira. So, iftira and shirk, these can destroy your chances at, at salvation even after you have believed. So when Allah is saying those people who believe in Allah and the last and final day of judgment, it is already understood that they have believed in Allah and they have not corrupted their belief in Allah with anything that constitutes shirk. Otherwise, if you have iman in Allah and the last and final day of judgment and you also do good deeds, but then you come and contaminate your iman, you allow it, your belief and your iman to be contaminated with shirk, then the Quran is very clear, no salvation for such a person. Because see, in this verse 82 of chapter 6, this is what Allah is saying. Iman is not sufficient. As a, as a criterion, Allah has mentioned in those verses, in verse 62 of surah number 2 and 69 of 5, He has said, Inna amanu. And then He repeats, Man amana billah. 
But then when Allah talks about amana billah, belief in Allah, is it just enough to believe that yes, there is Allah and then you can associate as many partners as you want with him or give his sifat to other slaves of his and then still get away saying that, well, I, I did satisfy the criterion of iman billah. Yani I believed in other shuraka and partners as well, as well, but the important thing for salvation is to believe in Allah, right? So that I believed. No, no, no. Allah says, I don't accept your belief in me. If you contaminate that belief with anything that constitutes shirk. So this idea, if you want to see where Allah has made it clear, you visit chapter 6, verse 82. There Allah is very clear. This is the whole argument of Ibrahim salam against his people. That it's not sufficient to believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you are making shuraka, if you're making partners with him. So he says, This is the statement that Allah is promoting here. That indeed those people who believe and then they do not allow their iman to become sullied, to become mixed and contaminated with zulm. And zulm in the context of iman is what? Is shirk. The Prophet clarified this. Because some of the sahaba they thought that zulm here can refer to zulm in the absolute sense. So the Prophet clarified, he said, no, no, no. Allah is talking here about Iman. The zulm that is the opposite of Iman is shirk. Not the other kinds of zulm, which are actually zulm at the level of action. So zulm can exist uh, in at two levels, at the level of belief and at the level of actions. So the zulm that mo people are most commonly familiar with, the zulm that is popularly understood is the practical zulm. So if you are an oppressor, for example, you're acting with injustice, you are usurping other people's rights, devouring their property, things like that, the practical aspect of zulm. So yes, th this practical aspect is also called zulm in Arabic, but there is also zulm fi muqabil al-iman. You have zulm in opposition to belief. At the level of belief, zulm is of two types, shirk, and iftira and both of these are labeled explicitly labeled as zulm by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran so that is why it has to be clear Allah is saying in verse 82 of surah number 6 that those people who believe and then they do not corrupt and cause their iman to become sullied and blemished with the blemish of shirk for such people there is peace in the hereafter and it is these people, Allah says, whom I consider to be rightly guided. Meaning it is not sufficient that you just say, Amantu billah. I believe in Allah. Now what I do beyond that, my salvation is still clear. No, your salvation is not clear until you first believe in Allah and then protect that belief of yours. The belief you have in Allah, you have to protect it from shirk. And yes, there are non-Abrahamic faiths. In fact, there are uh, within the Abrahamic faiths, outside the Abrahamic faiths, you will find a lot of non-Muslims who have managed to protect their belief in Allah, they believe in God, so they're not atheists, and they've also managed to protect their Iman in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from every blemish of shirk. They have somehow succeeded through their research, through their hard work. In the previous series, the Islah series, the Dispelling the Darkness series, we even mentioned the example of Raja Ram Mohan Roy, who is considered to be the father of the modern Indian Renaissance. By birth, he was a Hindu. He was born into a community of practicing Hindus who were devout idol worshippers. Yet, after he studied his own scriptures, as well as the scriptures of other religions, he was a polyglot, a master of multiple languages. He had mastered Arabic, Persian, Hebrew, Sanskrit, he, tr he had this uh, passion for studying every scripture in its native original language. Apparently, he also had this, uh, this uh, impulse within him uh, that is also responsible for my decision to actually try and master and specialize in Arabic, which was that as a person, if you don't want wool to be pulled over your eyes and you don't want to be fooled by exegetical and sectarian gimmicks one of the best ways to do that is to read read the texts that you're dealing with in the original language so that people cannot pull wool over your eyes and say well this word actually means this this means that there's a lot of this that goes on in in religious texts a lot of distortion misinterpretation for sectarian political social financial reasons 
many of the religious texts are distorted and misinterpreted. If you want to be safe from that, one of the ways to do that is to master the language, that no one should be able to fool you. So Raja Ramon Roy, it seems he did not want to be fooled by the scholars of the establishment. So he studied every scripture that he came across in its original language. So he learned the original languages for that purpose. He studied the Quran in Arabic. He studied the, the New Testament in the in, in, in the uh, Greek language in which it was available, the Greek translation, as well as he tried to uh, study the Hebrew version of the Old Testament, especially. And he studied the oldest Hindu scriptures in the original uh, Sanskrit in which, that they are, in which they are found. So after studying all these scriptures in their original languages, he comes to the conclusion that Tawheed is the correct Aqidah, that God is only one, and he campaigns. He campaigns against idol worship. He can campaigns against shirk within Hinduism. He was a great reformer of the Hindus. So he had Iman in Allah, a very firm belief in, in God, whom he frequently refers to in his writings as the author of the universe. He says the author and creator of the universe deserves our worship. We adore him. We worship him. And we do not associate any partners with him. We don't believe he has any image. We don't believe in sculptures or statues or any of that. So yes, this this qualifies as what Allah is describing in verse 82. If you study the writings of Raja Ram Mohan Roy, at least as far as his description of Tawheed is concerned, you would struggle to find any trace of shirk or zulm or iftira in as far as his understanding of Tawheed is concerned. So he's not even a member of an Abrahamic religion. He's not even a member of uh, the Ahlul, the, the, the specific, the Ma'na al-Khas for the Ahlul Kitab. You can say he's Ahlul Kitab bil Ma'na al-A'am, yani in the general sense, he's also, ultimately, how did he arrive at Tawheed? Through his books, he studied the oldest Hindu scriptures, and that's what he then came and started arguing. He said, Baba, you people have gone astray, you've gone, you've gone wildly astray. The original teachings of the Hindu religion are purely monotheistic, he discovers through his research. So in any case, the question about non-Abrahamic non religions and faith groups, if they satisfy the criteria, yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ultimately, he's a lord of justice and he has his rules. If you, if you pass by his rules, he has no interest, as he tells you in, in Surah An-Nisa, he says, ما يفعل الله بعذابكم إن شكرتم وأمنتم. He said, what interest does Allah have in punishing you? And in fact, Allah has no interest in punishing you. He himself says that. If you do two things, إن شكرتم, if you are thankful to him, وأمنتم, and if you believe in him. So he's not out there to get, get you and, you know, to punish his servant, servants by hook or by crook. He is a Lord who is actually, if you, if you go to see, he is opening the doors of mercy and forgiveness. And he is a Lord that's ever inclined towards giving consideration to the servants, not uh, a Lord who is punitive and vengeful in nature, as some sectarian groups and unfortunately some faith groups also try to project him as. Ultimately, this is their own ignorance and their own intolerance that they then, then tend to project on God. But God is way above, he's exalted above that kind of intolerance. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, yes, he has set the rules and yes, anyone who qualifies by his rules, then yes, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, uh, his promise is true, he does not go back on his promises. So if you have iman in Allah, and then you don't corrupt that iman with shirk, then it doesn't matter which community, which faith group, as I told you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to be judging people by their, by accident of birth on the day of judgment. And that you, by a stroke of Really good luck you were born, born into a Muslim family, so you get rewarded for that accident of birth for which you really deserve no credit, and you go to Jannah. And the person Bichara who is born into the wrong faith group, he goes to hell just because of accident of birth. No, this is the whole uh, teaching of the Quran. The Quran is showing you that people who believe can go to Jahannam if they corrupt their iman with shirk. And this is what Allah is saying, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مشركون. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, majority of people do not believe in Allah without committing shirk. So in other words, Allah is telling you, majority of mu'mineen 
are mushrikeen actually and they will they will suffer the punishment of that because as, as we mentioned before and as we've clarified in the Islam series the one crime for which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has no tolerance and he has promised that he will not forgive is shirk you look at the same surah surah al-an'am uh, chapter 6 verse 88 after mentioning 18 prophets Allah says walaw ashraku lahabitu anhum ma kanu ya'malu if they had committed shirk all their good deeds would have been cancelled. They would have been invalidated and annihilated. So yes, if you believe in Allah, you believe in the last and final day of judgment, and then you do good deeds. But on top of those good deeds, you also add the deed of shirk. So you, after believing in Allah, you compromise on that belief. You contaminate and corrupt and pollute that belief by adding elements of shirk into it. So Allah says, no salvation for you. Why? Because in verse 88 of chapter 6, he is showing you 18 of his topmost prophets. You know, the likes of Ibrahim alayhi salam and Nuh alayhi salam and Musa alayhi salam and Harun alayhi salam and Zakariya and Yahya and Isa alayhi salam. All these great, great prophets. Allah is telling you, these are great prophets who obviously believe in Allah. They believe in the last and final day of judgment. They believe in as much risala as existed during their time. They have fulfilled all the criteria. Yet Allah says, that if they had committed shirk yani if after believing in me they had corrupted and contaminated their belief in me by adding elements of shirk to their belief Allah says I would have cancelled and destroyed all their good deeds so you come on the day of judgment after having done shirk and you argue say Allah I believed in you because a mushrik at the end of the day believes in Allah or even Allah is not denying that he says, وَمَا يُؤْمِنُ أَكْثَرُهُمْ بِاللَّهِ إِلَّا وَهُمْ مُشْرِكُونَ So yes, majority of them, they do not believe in Allah except that they associate partners with Him. A mushrik cannot be a mushrik without believing in Allah because if you don't believe in Allah, how do you associate partners with an entity that you don't believe in in the first place? So these mabahith, we have already made them very clear. A mushrik is a mu'min. If you peel all the layers of shirk away, at the core, he's a mu'min, he's a believer. But Allah says this kind of belief has no value. That you believe in me and then you start associating partners with me or you commit any kind of shirk against me or even iftira for that matter. Iftira is also something that completely cancels out your chances at salvation as Allah has repeatedly clarified in numerous verses of the Quran that we have pre pre presented previously. So that is why Allah is mentioning all these great prophets and then in verse 88 he comes and says, وَلَوْ أَشْرَكُوا لَحَبِطُ عَنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُ Yes, they believed in Allah, they believed in the messengers, they believed in the last and final day of judgment, but if they were to commit shirk, I would cancel out all their good deeds. So if you come on the day, on the day of judgment, you have believed in Allah, and even all the five things that Allah requires you as a Muslim. So shirk is something that, that makes all your belief in all the five things, it makes those beliefs useless. Because... Even if you believe in Allah and the angels and the messengers and the last and final day of judgment and the scriptures, but after believing in all of this, you still end up doing shirk. Do you get your salvation or do you not get your salvation? Allah in the Quran is showing you no salvation for you because you committed shirk. And shirk is a crime that Allah repeatedly asserts. So not only verse 88 of Surah Al-An'am where he's talking about previous prophets, but rather if you come to Surah Al-Zumar, chapter 39, verse 65. Here Allah is talking about our Prophet and addressing our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Allah says وَلَقَدْ أُوحِيَ إِلَيْكَ وَإِلَى الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ لَإِنْ أَشْرَكْتَ لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ وَلَا تَكُنَنَّ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ Surely it has been revealed to you just as it was revealed to those before you that if you associate with me, if you commit shirk with me لَيَحْبَطَنَّ عَمَلُكَ your amal, your deeds, your actions will be invalidated. They will be rendered null and void. They will be nullified. And you shall be of the losers. Who is Allah telling this? He's telling this to his beloved prophet and messenger, the last and final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if Rasulullah, Allah is denying him salvation if he falls into shirk, which he never fell into. But Allah is saying, hypothetically speaking, in ashrakta, if you were to fall into shirk, I would cancel out all your good deeds. And you would be among the losers. So if shirk is such a great crime that even Rasulullah and Allah's greatest prophets of the past, if they cannot survive, 
if they cannot get their salvation, if they have brought shirk with them on the day of judgment, then you and I and other Abrahamic faiths, non-Abrahamic faiths, how can any other human being expect and hope for any salvation if he has infringed upon this criteria? So that is why it must be clarified that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about uh, the chances of salvation for non-Muslims in verses 62 of chapter 2 and verses 69 of chapter 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the first criterion he's mentioned is man amana billah. Under this criterion of amana billah, you have to add verse 82 of chapter 6. That amana billah, you have iman in Allah with its condition, with its prerequisite. And what is the prerequisite of iman billah? For your iman billah to be accepted, the prerequisite is walam yalbisu imanahum bizulmin. You should not have corrupted your iman in Allah by then having believed in shirk or in any claim that constitutes shirk. So this is the whole reason why reform and islah is so important because belief in Allah alone is not enough for salvation. The belief has to be free and pure of any and every trace of shirk. Until you purify yourself 100% from shirk, you are not able to avail salvation as per the Quranic criteria. So that is why when we come to then the question, there's another question that comes up. Okay, so then those categories of people that Allah has mentioned in verse 62 of chapter 2 and verse 69 of chapter 5. He mentions Jews, he mentions Christians. So then what about uh, Christians, for example, who believe in the Trinity? Christians who are involved in heavy duty shirk because they're claiming divinity for Jesus Christ, for example. And they're claiming that he's the son of God. They're also doing iftira. And uh, what about Jews who claimed that a group among them who claimed that Uzair is the son of Allah? Or for example, Jews who fell into the shirk of obeying their scholars in opposition to what Allah had revealed in their scripture. So in, if you look at uh, Surah number 9, verses 30, 31, you find Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there also is talking about the Ahlul Kitab. And there he condemns the Ahlul Kitab, the Jews and Christians, a group among them. He says, They have taken their rabbis and their spiritual monks, their spiritual leaders as lords besides Allah. And taking someone as a lord besides Allah is shirk. So Allah is accusing them of shirk. And the Prophet and Imams in numerous narrations have explained why exactly, what Allah means by this. He says, they, it's not that they were worshipping them or praying or prostrating before their scholars rather they were doing something that mashallah even you find today in the muslim ummah going on big time which is following the scholar even when the scholar goes against the clear ayat and verses of allah in the book you follow instead of following the clear command of allah in the book and the clear teaching of allah in the scripture you follow what the scholar says assuming obviously remember the road to hell, as they say, is paved with assumptions and good intentions and good good assumptions, as the British say. So yeah, the assumption always is the people who blindly follow their scholars all the way to hell. Their assumption is that, look, even if the scripture is saying something that seems to be going, uh, that, that seems to be contradicting what our scholar is saying, surely our scholar has read the scripture. Our scholar is familiar with the scripture and yet he is giving this fatwa or yet he is teaching us this. So the scholar probably knows better. But Allah in the Quran, he expects you, you, the public, he expects you to know better. That's the whole reason why he's condemning the Jews and Christians. Allah doesn't say, no, actually, you know, the Jews and Christians, okay, yes, they followed their scholars and their scholars gave them wrong teachings. In some cases, they even taught them shirk. In many cases, they made the halal of Allah haram and the haram of Allah halal. But okay, the scholars are to blame because they knew better. The public, bichara, they assume that these scholars who are teaching us the deen, they have read the book, they have studied the scripture. For so many decades at the, at the religious seminaries, they have specialized and acquired unique expertise into these scriptures. So they probably know what they're talking about. They probably have studied the scripture better than us. And even after that, if they're giving us a verdict that seemingly contradicts the book, they must have some good faith basis for that. They must have some logic behind that. They must have, they must have, they must have all these kinds of assumptions that people hold for their scholars. But these assumptions, Allah is saying, whatever your assumptions are, if your scholars go against my book, 
If I have made something halal in the book, they say it is haram. If I have made something haram, they say it is halal. If I have declared something to be kufr and shirk in my book, they tell you, no, 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 it's okay, it's halal. You can go ahead and do it. It is not shirk. Allah ultimately, in such instances, he expects you to follow the book. But what did the Jews and Christians do? They, as Allah says, فَنَبَذُهُ وَرَأَ ظُهُورِهِمْ They threw the book behind their backs. They said, the book let the scholars deal with. We will follow what the scholars are telling us. So Allah says, okay. اِتَّخَذُوا أَحْبَارَهُمْ وَرُهْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابَ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ Guess what? Even though you are monotheists, you claim to be monotheists, you are Ahlul Tawheed, you believe in Allah, you are still in my eyes. You are mushrik, you have committed shirk. And where, which shirk, which idol did we worship? So this is the big lesson that you learn when you, once you study the Quran. Is that idol worship is just one kind of shirk. There are several other kinds of shirk. And following your scholars blindly, even when they go against the clear teachings that Allah has given you in the book, even this is a form of shirk. So the Jews and Christians, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only offering those Jews and Christians salvation who have believed in him. And then they have not sullied and corrupted their iman with any kind of shirk. So those Jews and Christians who blindly followed their rabbis and their spiritual leaders, and they went against what Allah had revealed in the scripture, such Jews and Christians, Allah is not offering them salvation. And that's why in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear. This is something that we need more latitude on and we can discuss. It's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is offering a blanket uh, salvation. To the Ahlul Kitab in verses 62 of chapter 2 and verse 69 of chapter 5. It's not, not blanket salvation. It is salvation only for those Jews and Christians who manage to salvage the Tawheed and the belief in Allah free from all traces of shirk. So, Ya Allah, what about those Ahlul Kitab, those Jews and Christians, for example, who did believe in Allah, but they fell into other beliefs, they did iftira against Allah, for example, they believed in false claims about Allah, or they committed other acts that constitute shirk or kufr. So for them, Allah is very clear. You only need to check and, and, and visit Surah al bayyina chapter 98 of the Quran, verse 6. Allah is very clear. He's, he tells you, إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا Allah tells you, indeed, those who did kufr from among the Ahlul Kitab. So, يعني, what does Allah mean? إِنَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ So, I thought Ahlul Kitab are all mu'minun. They believe in Allah. They believe in Isa alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam at least. Huh? They believe in the last and final day of judgment. So, what is this kufr Allah is talking about? No, Allah says, yes. Among the Ahlul Kitab, among the Jews and Christians, we will separate them into two groups. There are Mu'mineen among them, Minhumul Mu'mineen as Allah says, but wa akhtaruhumul fasiqoon. The majority of them are rebellious. But there is a group of Ahlul Kitab who in the eyes of Allah, their aqidah is free of shirk. So even today you have Unitarian Christians. Even today you have Jews who are really firm and passionate on Tawheed and they believe in Tawheed free from all the blemishes of shirk. So they don't believe Allah has any image. They don't believe Allah has any son, any partner, any rival, any equal. Their tawheed is completely pure. So such groups, Allah accepts their iman billah. And if their iman billah is accepted, then they only need iman bil yawm al-akhir. Believe in the last and final day of judgment. And number three, they need good deeds. And obviously, if you keep other verses of the Quran as well, they, they need to be able to prove Allah that they were not rebellious. So yes, you can have the perfect aqidah, but if you are guilty of rebellion, Allah doesn't tolerate rebellion. So even if you have a correct aqidah, but then you knowingly rejected, let's say risala, that's why risala is a problem and it is a barrier to salvation for those people on whom it became established on. So those people who received news of risala in such a way that they could be convinced by it, and that they, they did not have any good faith basis for rejecting it. So even if they believe in Allah, last and final day of judgment, do good deeds. Allah talks about them. We mentioned the verse from Surah An-Nisa where Allah says, those people who try to discriminate between the messengers. Yani they say, We will believe in some, we will reject the others. Allah says, no salvation for them. They are the real kuffar. And what is Allah saying for the kuffar? In الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا مِنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ وَالْمُشْرِكِينَ فِي نَارِ جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدِينَ فِيهَا أُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ شَرُّ الْبَرِيَةِ 
Allah says indeed those people who disbelieve, who do kufr from among the Ahlul Kitab and also the Mushrikeen, they shall be finari jahannam, they shall be in the fire of jahannam, khalidina fiha, living there for an extremely long period of time, ulaika hum sharrul bariya. These are the worst of creations. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear that if you corrupt your iman with anything that constitutes either shirk or kufr or iftira, then the doors of salvation are closed on such a person. So in any case, yes, uh, the criteria that Allah has described, if you look at the picture holistically, and we can inshallah go deeper into this to, to look at the, yeah, I mean, this maybe for some of you is a new concept and a new idea that even within Ahlul Kitab, they are mu'minun and they are kuffar. Yes, and even among Ahlul Islam, even among the Muslimin, among the Muslims, yes, Allah will divide the Muslims. There will be people on the Day of Judgment who will be labeled kuffar. Among the Muslims, yes, there is a concept of kufr ba'd al-Islam, disbelieving after accepting Islam. So kufr, once you become a Muslim, you are neither immune from kufr, nor are you immune from shirk. This is not a, a simple uh, plaything. This is a matter of salvation. If you end up believing in the kind of beliefs that the kuffar and mushrikeen believed in, you just change the, the name. And this is unfortunately what has happened. Shirk has entered Islam as well, no doubt about that. The only thing that has changed is the names. So instead of, for example, the Christians, in their case, instead of supplicating to idols, they supplicate to the Virgin Mary. And Allah labels this as clear kufr and shirk in the Quran, as you will see. Similarly, within uh, Sunnis and Shias, within the Muslim Ummah, shirk has infiltrated again. The, it's just the names have been changed. In some places, Instead of Allah, the entity being supplicated to is Imam Ali Islam, for example, or Hazrat Abbas, for example, or Imam Musa Al-Kadhim Islam, for example. If you go in the other sect, it is Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani, for example. Ghawth Pak and, and the Sufi saints are being invoked. At the end of the day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it doesn't matter. It's not that if you invoke a wali and a pious servant, he will forgive you. And if you invoke or, you know, have false beliefs about a, a, a deviant slave of his, then only he will punish you. No, the Christians, they elevated to divinity one of the most beloved slaves of Allah, Isa alayhi salam. Did it help them? So when it comes to shirk, Allah says, it doesn't matter whether you associate a stone with me or whether you associate my closest angels with me or whether you associate my greatest prophets with me or you associate my most pious slaves with me, doesn't matter. Ultimately, when Allah forbids shirk in the Quran, He says, Allah to shirk be shay'a. He says, Do not associate anything with me. Uh, forget about anyone. Allah uses the, the, the minutest description. So, shay'a, if it is shay, if it is an existent entity, don't associate it with me. Don't hold it equal to me. Don't make it a rival entity in terms of your worship and your devotion and adoration. Do not set up equals with me. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very clear about this. And inshallah, uh, we can go deeper into this if there is time and talk about kufr ba'd al-Islam and kufr ba'd al-Iman and the kufr of Ahlul Kitab and the kufr and shirk that has penetrated, unfortunately, the millah of Islam. Wa akhiru da'wana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.